So we, this morning, will continue our journey through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, if you are new here this year, we are journeying through this book. It'll take us, I think, through the rest of the year and possibly into next year. But we are in chapter 3 this morning. And before we read it, I will warn you, there are some words in the text that we often do not like. Words like submission, subjection, weaker, uh, Lord... And these type of words at times kind of make us go, oh, boy, I don't really know what I, what I think about this. And, and so some would say that texts like this are what would be called a descriptive text, meaning it's not commanding or prescribing us anything. It's simply describing how a relationship or a role worked in the first century in Rome or in the ancient Near East Um, Let me give you an example of like a descriptive text. Um, When Abraham sends his servant Eleazar to go get a wife for Isaac, Eleazar ends up giving the prospective bride, um, Rebecca, a nose ring. So we would say this is a descriptive text. There are things we can learn from it. It's not prescribing that in order for you to get married, you need to get some relative to go find a distant relative for you to marry, and then to bring her back but, and to give her a nose ring is a sign. Like, we are not prescribing anything. It's simply describing an individual instance that we can learn something about God and ourselves from. But there are prescriptive passages as well that prescribe roles or responsibilities or expectations or commands. Genesis 2, I would say, is a prescriptive text. It it speaks of the creation and marriage of Adam and Eve. And some would say, well, it feels like it's just describing something. But I believe it's prescribing something because it speaks generally of marriage between husbands and wives. And it is a text that Jesus and Paul use when they teach on marriage. And so when we look at text, we have to say, are, are we being prescribed something or described something here. I believe in First Peter we are being prescribed something. We are being, is talking about the opportunity that we have as children of God, as husbands and wives, to live out the gospel in our marriages in front of others. See, God has a vision for, for what life in marriage is his people looks like. He, he tells us, right, like we are, a, a, we are exiles, we are sojourners, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, we are a holy nation. And these are things that we, we then take and say, all right, what does this look like to live out in this century here in the West? But we, we need to be careful to not quickly dismiss a text is irrelevant or outdated because maybe it makes us uncomfortable. Or we're not quite sure what to do with it. But this text that we're look at today, as much as maybe we will struggle with it at times, to the original hearers, this would have been empowering and uplifting. They would have looked at this as an amazing thing. And so we remember the Bible is not written to us, it's written for us, but it was the, the letter of First Peter was written to these exile Christians. And to some wives that are married now to unbelievers. And they're asking, what is it, what does it look like for me to live as a wife at, who has been delivered from my sin by God's great mercy, uh, who has a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, who's a sojourner in exile, a chosen race, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people of God's own possession. What does it look like for me to live within my own home? as a believer. And Peter is going to talk about that, what it's like for her and what that is and and what she should expect and how she should live, and also for a husband. See, marriage is a gift that God has given to us um, to reflect the gospel, but also to be a wonderful source of blessing in our lives. And hopefully for those of you that are here, that you would say, yes, marriage has been a wonderful blessing in my life. Even if you're not married, the marriage of your parents and your friends has been a wonderful source of blessing in your lives. Hopefully that 
is your, been your experience. And I know for some of you it's not. Marriage is, as one theologian says, gloriously difficult. And so it is often done wrong. And people don't get things right. They don't follow God's ways. And so at times it has not been a glorious blessing in people's lives. But let me, let me quote here for a moment John Piper. He says this, The aim for your marriage is not for your spouse to satisfy your every longing. That's Christ's job. Knowing he has met all our needs and fulfills us completely, we can freely give ourselves away. Marriage is meant by God to put the gospel reality on display in the world. That is why we are married. That is why all married people are married. The Bible envisions marriage as this one flesh union between a husband and wife where they love, help, and serve one another in sacrificial covenant two-person community where there is equal value and dignity, but I would argue for distinctive roles. See, marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not this, hey, if you do this, then I will do this. Marriage is a covenant. I am here for you no matter what, and I will do as I ought no matter what. It, it, it is a lifelong covenant made between two people and God. And it should be a place of safety where you are completely known and completely loved and where you live for the edification of one another in the glory of God. It's a community of grace where sacrificial love for the good of the other and the glory of God is primary. And I think 1 Peter 3 teaches us something about this. And so if you have your Bible, you can follow along with me. We will read the first seven verses. Um, we will only talk about the first six. Um, and men, these first six verses really aren't written for you. These, you don't need to memorize these. You don't need to make sure your wife is taking really good notes this morning. Um, next week is more for you. You can listen in as, as we try to understand what Peter is saying here. It says, likewise, wives... Be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, your word instructs us that the one who delights in your word is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in the season and that its leaves do not wither. Lord, we desire to be that tree. So please open up your word to us this morning so that we can be rooted in your word, nourished in your word, and sustained by your word. Holy Spirit, use the things of your word to change us from within. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I, I would like to look at this text with you this morning backwards, if that'll be all right. And what I want to look at first, before we get to maybe the verse that is kind of a bit controversial to some about submission, is to look at what he says about godly womanhood. And I appreciate um, Tim Keller and John Piper primarily on a lot of the truths they bring out from this text. Um, but what does it teach us about godly womanhood? And so let's start in verse 5. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. 
And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So those women who are holy means those women who are set apart for God and for the things of God. They lived with this deep godliness by placing their hope in God. Godly women do not put their hope in being married. You can desire that, but that is not where you should place your hope. You do not place your hope in your husband. You do not place your hope in your family. You do not place your hope in your looks. You place your hope in the promises of God. We need confident trust that God is who he says he is, that what he says will happen will happen, and that we trust that his word is true. Honestly, this should, this should be true of all of us, that our hope is in God and not in something of this world or some other relationship, but that our hope is in him in him alone. Then he goes on to say this, and this is directly tied to someone who lives with their hope in God. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So this godly woman who places her hope in God, not in her marriage, not in her husband, not in her looks, does good and has a fearlessness about her. This is what a hope in God produces. Good works and a fearlessness. So, right, so we hope in God. We trust in God. We know God. We know his word. We, we live out the gospel. We, we base our life upon the promises that God has. And then because of that, we do good. We do the good works that God has planned for us. We live as we ought to live according to scripture, no matter how anybody else lives. And we are fearless. We think rightly about God. We trust in the sovereign power and promises of God. I think Peter is saying this is what a godly life looks like. And here he's saying this. I think this would be godliness for anybody. But here he's saying this in relationship to, to godly womanhood. Is they know God. They love God. They trust in his promises. They do good by living as God calls them to live. And they fear God alone. They don't fear anything else. When I read that, the thing that comes to my mind is probably Proverbs 31. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me or you can follow on the screen. But Proverbs 31 has this excellent description of the woman who fears Yahweh. And I would like to read this to you because I think this helps put some things in perspective as well. Is when we think about what it is to live submissive, I think we have a kind of a thought in our head that probably doesn't line up with Scripture. And so let me read Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10, and to go through the end of the chapter. An excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. 
She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Yahweh is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. This is a woman, this is a wife who trusted in God's promises, did good by work, by working hard in her life, and was fearless. If a godly woman who hopes in God does good and is fearless and submits to her husband, we'll talk about that in a bit, then this woman in Proverbs 31 is a godly woman who hoped in God, did good, was fearless, and chose to willfully submit to her husband. But then you think, whoa, look how she is described. That is, that's amazing. That's not probably how normally we think of submission in this sense. Someone who cares well for her family is incredibly productive. Her family is well cared for because of her hard work. She's devoted to her husband and her family. They're able to live their life. He's able to lead in the community because of her. Sometimes I read Proverbs 31 and I think, what does he do? It, it reminds me, I was in Kenya once, and I was learning what they did, and the, this wife, she took care of the kids, she took care of the herd, she built the house, and I asked her husband, what do you do? And he looked at me and said, I'm a warrior. I was like, well, when's the last time you killed a lion? Probably has been a while, <laughs> right? She's not some meek, weak, unproductive, unable to do anything without her husband's bidding, which I think is, tends to be how we tend to assume a submissive wife is. She accomplishes lots. Her husband trusts in her. And look at Proverbs 31, 25. Strength and dignity are clothing. It's not external, it's internal. We'll talk about that in a moment. And she laughs at the time to come. She laughs at the future. She laughs at what the future could bring or might bring because she hopes in God. She has worked hard to help and provide and care for her family. As one theologian said, godly women fight the anxiety that rises in their hearts because of the difficulty and the unknown of this life. I, the best way I can understand this is anxiety is a mind response. Your mind, biblically speaking, your mind and your heart are the same thing. They are the seat of your thought and your emotion. This godly woman fights this anxiety, this mind response to fear, Fear is not always bad, but fear the fear of some things can become warped or drawn out and it becomes anxiety. She fights that by, by thinking rightly about who God is and what God has promised and just by the busyness, the activity of her life. I'm not saying anxiety that cannot be caused by anything physical. You are an embodied soul. Everything that happens to your body affects you spiritually, and everything you do spiritually affects your body. But she knows her Bible. She knows her Heavenly Father. She knows his promises. She knows what needs to be done to care for and provide for her family. She knows that God will be with her and help her and strengthen her, and she takes care of that. It's not saying that this battle to, to fight anxiety or to live fearless is easy, but it takes both mental, spiritual, and physical things. And this is the deep, unshakable foundation of a godly woman. She hopes in God. She, she is fearless. She does good. She laughs at the time to come. That's what Peter is, is how Peter is describing her. Then if we can back up to verse 3. It says, Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So he says the focus is on the internal over the external. It's not saying there, there's no care for the external. I remember once when somebody said, oh, as a believer, you, sh you shouldn't even worry about your body. You shouldn't have to go to the gym or do anything like that. Let's read 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8 says this, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. 
Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, it doesn't say it's of no value. It's of value. But godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise for the present life. It's, we need to hold it in the right balance. Yes, take care of yourself physically. But take care of your soul more. Right? It reminds me of a, a quote by Augustine that said, Take care of your body as if it were going to live forever. And take care of your soul as if you were going to die tomorrow. We are embodied souls. We talk about stewardship often when it comes to finances. But what about the stewardship of your body? God gave you a body. Without it, how do you do the work of the kingdom? How, how, how can you be a good father, good mother without taking care of your body? How can you be a good employee? How can you be a good neighbor? Take care of yourself physically. But then take better care of your soul your inner self. Mortify your sin and feed godliness. The godly woman's identity is not found externally, but it is rooted internally in what is described as an imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Let's talk about that. Gentle. What is the word picture we get when we think of gentle? Maybe it's this kind of similar to when we think of submissive, right? Weak, cowardly, mindless, soft-spoken. But that's not true. Biblically, that's not what gentleness is. The word for gentle is praos, which is used four times in the New Testament. In Matthew 5.5, 5, we read, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. It's, Gentle is, it's not weak, it's not cowardly, it's not soft-spoken. That, that doesn't inherit the earth. Often we think of blessed are the meek. Meek may be a better word here, but it's ins not insisting on one's rights. It's not being pushy or selflessly assertive. It's not demanding one's way. And since it's a controlled power. Anytime this word is used in extra-biblical literature, it's used to speak of a wild animal that has been tamed. See, a wild animal like a stallion is of very little value when, if it has not been tamed. It kicks, it bites, it runs into fences, it causes all kinds of problems. It, it's powerful, but out of control. But once it's been tamed, it is useful. It is controlled power. Blessed are the meek, those that have controlled power, for they shall inherit the earth. The other times that this word is used, one is in Matthew 21, when Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a colt or of a donkey, and he says this, right, that it's gentle. But then what does Jesus do next? He goes and he flips tables from the money changers. He has controlled power. The other time it's used is when Jesus describes himself. Of everything Jesus could say about himself, he says this, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. Peter's telling you to be gentle. He's not telling you to be mindless or cowardly or powerless or soft-spoken, saying live your life like Jesus. Have power that is under control. Women, wives, you have power. Cultivate that you are using it in a godly way, in a controlled way. And then he talks about quietness, which means peacefulness. Cultivate a calming and peaceful influence on your family and those around you. One person said it this way, while the husband is the head of the home, determines the direction of the home, you as the wife determine the atmosphere. Choose to make a place that is peaceful, calm, and restful. Cultivate the hidden and gentle, quiet person of the heart, for this is precious in the sight of God. Why is that precious in the sight of God? Because to choose to live your life that way, you have to hope and trust in God. And then he goes on to, to say this, right? Since a godly woman puts her hope in God, allows her to do good works, it drives out fear, it allows her to focus on her heart, which leads to an inner peacefulness, 
which is revealed in an outer peacefulness, he says in verse 1, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see their respectful and pure conduct. This is kind of an interesting statement to me because when Paul makes a statement about wives submitting, it's a theological argument. Paul says God created man first and he gave him this role. And just as the son submits to the father, though they are equal, the wife should submit to the husband, though they are equal. Peter is not making a theological argument here. He's making an apologetic one. He says, we want everyone to know Christ. We want everyone to live within the church. We want them to live honorable and beautiful lives in ways that would lead as many others to come to know Christ as possible. And he thought the best way for a wife to win her husband to Christ is without a word. Is living a beautiful life of conduct. And if you compare that to Proverbs 27, that says a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. Peter's saying that's not how you live. We, we live, wives live in submission, willful submission to their husbands so that they may know Christ. An honorable, beautiful life would be respectful and pure conduct. Just, just like he, he talked earlier about Christian citizens are to put to silence their adversaries by devoting themselves to submitting to the government and their good works, saying, wives, the same. Augustine, the great theologian, watched his own father come to Christ this way. He said, for years his mother served her unbelieving husband, but finally when he was about to die, he submitted himself to Christ. And this is what Augustine wrote in his journal to God. She served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of, of you by her conduct by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. So what is it to be subject? What is it? We've talked about this a few weeks ago. What is it to submit or to live under the authority of another? For this submission is voluntary, willful act on the part of the wife to come under the authority and the headship of her husband. Not all women to all men, but wives to husbands. This is a debated topic, and, and not all. Some would say all this is descriptive, and it was that culture in that time, and there is no submission, and they hold what's called an egalitarian view. Others would say, well, actually, it's all women to all men. No, no woman should ever ref a men's sporting event or ever be a boss at work. I don't believe that. I believe what this is a compliment. It's called complementarianism, that, that within the church and home, godly men are called to lead. So what is this idea of submission? First, you need to understand that when it's spoken of, it's spoken of in middle voice, meaning nowhere Ever in scripture are men told to subordinate their wives. Never once. That's why I say, man, this isn't a verse you need to memorize. Nowhere are men commanded to make their wives submit. It is willful, free, voluntary choice. Men, next week we will talk to you about what it is to be a godly husband. But this is a command to the wives. So to understand what it is, let's explain what it is not. That'll help us. What it is not, and I appreciate John Piper, and you find there's many other places, but, well, maybe he was the first. Submission is not inconsistent with equality in Christ. Men and women, husbands and wives, have been equally created, equally redeemed, and have equal importance, dignity, honor, and value before Jesus Christ. It is simply a matter of distinctive roles. Two, Submission does not mean agreeing with everything your husband says. Verse 1, right? She is a Christian. He is not. Her, he has one worldview. She has another. Peter calls her to submissiveness while assuming she will not submit to his, her view 
or his view of the most important thing in the world, and that is God. She chose Christ. Submission does not mean leaving your brain or your will at the wedding altar. Submission is not based on lesser intelligence or competence. It has nothing to do with inferiority versus superiority or an inability or unwillingness to think for yourself. Here is a wife who heard the gospel, thought through the gospel, considered the beauty of Christ, and chose Jesus Christ apart from her husband while he did not choose. It says here that to submit to your wife, even if some do not obey the word, meaning that he heard the word, and he chose not to obey it. Some husbands chose to obey, some did not. And he's saying here, he chose to not, she chose to. She has ability and mind to think for herself. Submission does not mean avoiding every effort to change your husband. Now, this is tricky, because usually when people are getting married, I say, don't go into marriage thinking, well, I'm going to change them, Um, because you're not. I mean, you will, but you shouldn't go into marriage thinking, well, everything's perfect, but I can just change this one thing. But here, right, she is choosing to live her life in a way, hoping to change her husband, hoping that he, she will win her husband to Christ without a word. Submission here seems to paradoxically be used as a strategy to change her husband for Christ. Five, submission does not mean putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. Submission to Jesus changes our other submissions, whether to husband, government, employer, parents, or any of that. Even when Sarah called Abraham her husband Lord, it was a lowercase al, where it is submission to Yahweh, Jesus Christ as Lord, is uppercase al. means our submission is first and foremost to Christ. Even Paul says, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Right? Your, your husband is not Christ. But we, ch- and we choose, or you should choose to submit to your husband, not out of your husband's greatness, but as an act of obedience to Christ's greatness. Six, submission does not mean that a wife gets her spiritual strength primarily through her husband. Now, a godly husband should be a strength and edification of his wife. But here, she does not get that from her husband. She chooses to get her spiritual strength herself and does it for her husband. She assumes just the opposite. She is summoned to develop depth and strength and character, not from her husband, but for her husband. Seven, submission does not mean that a wife is to act out of fear. Do not fear anything. This is willful. It is not coerced. And remember again, husbands, nowhere are you commanded to make your wives submit. A Christian woman, a wife, is free. She will live out of that freedom. She should not live in fear. And eight, since submission does not mean a wife should live in fear, she should not live within the abuses of her husband. If a woman fears for her safety or her children's safety, she should remove herself from that environment. However, that separation should be for the purpose of transformation and restoration. Not all will agree with me here, but I believe 1 Corinthians 7 speaks to this. I believe 1 Corinthians 7 gives, it says this, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. Marriage is a covenant between two people. In certain cases, that covenant is shattered. Adultery and desertion by an unbeliever. Here's what I think, and not everybody will agree with me on this, is that when that covenant is shattered through adultery, the other spouse has the right to divorce. doesn't mean they have to. They can seek reconciliation, but that God has given them because of the hardness of heart, the, the freedom to go for divorce. The scripture also speaks of that with the desertion of an unbeliever, that they can try, but if a partner is not a believer and abandons you, 1 Corinthians 7 says, let him go. Some theologians, and I agree, that abuse is an act of desertion. 
that in an act of abuse, that if, if they are an unbeliever, that you can let them go. It, you, and this is, we don't have the time to try to work through this all this morning. And if they claim to be a believer, shame on them, first of all. And, and secondly, then they should repent and change. And if they do not, through church discipline, the leadership of the church could declare them an unbeliever. Maybe we'll talk more about that some other time. But, but abuse should not be in the home. Submission is not allowing your, does not mean you have to put up with abuse. There are biblical grounds for divorce. The decision should not be made alone. And that's where you would seek the counsel of leadership. So then what does submission mean? If I can quote Piper again, submission is a wife's disposition to honor her husband's authority, affirm her husband's leadership, and help him carry out that leadership through her own unique giftedness, which will ultimately lead to the maximum amount of blessing in a marriage and flourishing in a family. Submission is an inner quality of gentleness and quietness that affirms the leadership of the husband. It means making a choice to affirm your husband as the leader within the limits of obedience to Christ. It's a demeanor that honors him and an attitude that honors him. Submission acknowledges an authority that is not mutual. I believe scripture teaches often mutual submission, but there is a sense in which the husband has an authority the wife does not have. Third, submission is to be to your own husband. As I said this before, it is not every woman to every man. It is a wife to her husband. She chooses one man that she desires and to submit to his leadership. Not all men, one. And it's finally, as I noted earlier, your submission is as to the Lord. Submit not because of your husband's greatness, but because of Christ's greatness and your desire to obey him and glorify him in all things. A wife makes a choice to place herself as an equal under her husband. She comes under his lead just as the church does to Christ and Jesus does to the Father for the effectiveness and flourishing of the home. We all struggle with submitting to authority. All of our flesh tells us no. All of our flesh tells us that our greatest thing in life, our greatest joy, and is all that is when we, we have power, we have control, we have autonomy. And, and Peter is saying no. Like to, to live as a chosen race, a holy priesthood, uh, a holy nation and an unholy nation, we have the ability to reflect the gospel in our homes. And again, John Piper says this, marriage is not mainly about staying in love. It is about covenant keeping. And the main reason it is about covenant keeping is that God designed the relationship between a husband and his wife to represent the relationship between Christ and the church. This is the deepest meaning of marriage. And that is why ultimately the roles of headship and submission are so important. If our marriages are going to tell the truth about Christ and his church, we cannot be indifferent to the meaning of headship and submission. And let it not go without saying that God's purpose for the church and for the Christian wife who represents it is her everlasting holy joy. Christ died for them to bring that about. So for those of you who have godly husbands, this will be easier. Not easy, but easier. There will be areas where he may stumble and be not all that God has called and created and redeemed him to be, and you are there to be his helpmate and his encourager. For those of you who have husbands who are generally good but not really godly because of their own ignorance of scripture, immaturity, or weakness of character, or just laziness, this will be more difficult for you. But you are a means by which God can and will change him by your own godliness. For those of you with ungodly husbands, your life will be more difficult. But he does not, if he does not share your faith in Christ and your desire for godliness. But as long as he is willing to dwell with you, live your life in a way that fights for his soul. And if you are not married, this passage serves as a warning to be very careful about whom you would choose to marry. Girls, find a man who has character such as described in Psalm 15. Guys, find a girl who has the character of Proverbs 31. Evaluate off the scripture, 
not off what the world says we should look for. And as you leave today, check your thoughts. Check your attitudes. Your marriage, all our marriages are called to reflect the gospel. If you are leaving here today thinking, I sure hope she listened and took a lot of really good notes, you're wrong. You have the wrong attitude. We are so quick to admit that we are not perfect, but we are just slightly more perfect than our spouse. We need the attitude of what Tim Keller says, is I'm going to treat my self-centeredness as the main problem in my marriage. Then you might have a chance at a really beautiful marriage. Right? We look at the logs in our own eye before we try to remove the speck in our spouse's eye. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is our desire that our marriages, that our lives would exist for the good of our relationships, the good of others, and the glory of you. May our lives and our marriages magnify Christ in everything. We pray this in your name. Amen.